introduce one of my colleagues, a mentor, also a friend, um, Dr. Sigurd Bourbon. He'll be talking about appropriate use of surgery in the elderly patient with spinal deformity. Thanks, Marcus. Well, uh, thanks again, Chris and Vidette. I think uh, it's 12th, 12th annual, and I think I've been here just about every time, so I appreciate the opportunity to contribute. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, cover some new ground and make some progress over the past uh, 12 years, and hopefully I'll, I'll share with you some of the new information I have on, on a topic that I think is very important. These are my disclosures. I don't think they're relevant to, to uh, the talk here. But we're going to talk about the aging spine. And um, this is an international congress. And, and recognizing that uh, problems with the aging spine are uh, universal and, and worldwide. Now, I'll talk a bit about the demographics of that. But that's just to set the background on why this is such an important topic. And specifically, what is appropriate uh, for how we treat our aging population and it's becoming, again, a priority for our healthcare systems internationally. This is a worldwide demographic map. And, and what was so impressive to me is the notion that there's going to be a five-fold increase over the course of our lifetimes of people over the age of 65. Uh, again, these are worldwide numbers. And uh, I, I bring up this chart that includes uh, uh, Asia, uh, where the problem is, is uh, maybe even more so, the demographic inversion of the pyramid, even more so than it is in, in Europe and the U.S. So recognizing how do we deal with our aging population, the social cost of that, as well as the medical cost of that, is significant. And we recognize our aging population wants to be more active as well and wants to stay active. <clears throat> We've written about this uh, burden socioeconomically and the burden on our healthcare system of uh, uh, aging spine problems, and we recognize that uh, the, the prevalence of deformity in older patients, and, and right now, more than half of admissions, and in fact, most of our deformity admissions, are uh, our average age was about 68 in some of our studies, but most of our admissions are in patients over age 60, even though they represent less than 20% of the population, and of course, this is growing. We've also written about this in terms of looking at national inpatient samples, the relative rapid rise of multi-level surgery, and the highest rate of rise was actually in patients undergoing more than eight levels, so a four-fold increase in patients having surgery more than eight levels, and these are patients over 60 years old. So, so when is this appropriate, and when does the risk exceed the benefit? And we recognize that spinal disorders in the elderly are common. They represent a convergence of degenerative pathology and, and deformity. And so importantly, the concurrence of comorbidities, uh, so osteoporosis, frailty, sarcopenia, um, uh, senility, uh, these comorbidities uh, perhaps are more important than some of the obvious parameters, including radiographic parameters that we might look at. So understanding the phenotype of these patients, I think, is really critical. And one of my favorite parts about this course is on Saturday is doing cases, and uh, we'll, we'll see some really uh, uh, good cases. I certainly brought some of my own uh, uh, failures and successes, but I really appreciate the interdisciplinary nature of how we have conversation about these. And, and what we'll see is we'll see a patient presented with some demographics, age and gender typically, a bit about the symptoms, and we'll really focus on the x-rays. And then we'll come up with incredibly strong conviction. Sometimes the people who know least about the patient being the most convicted in their, in their uh, recommendations. So incredibly strong convictions on what ought to be done. And, and what I'm gonna to submit to you is that we re very rarely understand the real predictors of the phenotype or the predictors of outcome with this type of a presentation. And this, this is just a case that I pulled out of uh, one of my cases. And again, this is typically how we present. We make vast recommendations based on very little evidence. So what else do we wanna know? Now, I think there's a lot of other parts of the phenotype that would give us more granularity. And rather than making an a assessment based on some gestalt, actually being able to be quantifiable about this. So, for example, we want to know a little bit about body morphometry. So how is weight held? And, you know, Shane talks a lot about the, the obese patient maybe having more trouble leaning forwards compared to a patient who might be thinner. The transition from sitting to standing, we won the Issel's Prize for that. Understanding with more granularity the um, uh, bone quality. And uh, so not only bone density, but the quality of the bone. And we've done some work looking at Hounsfield units, so the UIV as being a predictor of junctional pathology and of subsidence of inner body implants. 
uh, the uh, phenotype including uh, sarcopenia. So really understanding with some granularity uh, the muscle density and being able to quantify this. We do it to work now uh, with the National Science Foundation funded grant using ultrasound in a clinic to try and qu quantify uh, uh, muscle quality, especially at the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, so these details of the phenotype, I think, would really give us a lot more information about what's an appropriate intervention, and especially for our elderly patients where we get the convergence of sarcopenia, of frailty, of osteoporosis, that are perhaps more important predictors of outcome than um, the radiographic parameters alone. We know that the radiographic parameters, and Chris has spoken to this quite a lot, you know, the R values at best are maybe 0.4, so meaning 16% of somebody's self-reported health status is predicted by radiographs. So what are the other predictors? Well, maybe up to 50% of it is actually the social determinants of health. We had a couple papers at NAS this year looking at some of the social determinants of health, some of which are modifiable and, and some of which, which aren't going to be. But but uh, recognizing there's much more to the picture when we try and understand this frail, the, the, the phenotype. And rather than kind of going with a gestalt uh, of, well, this patient reminds me of somebody I've seen before, really trying to be more quantifiable about this. And, and I think that this avoids some of the problems of heurism, some of the problems of intrinsic bias. And this is an area that I've been more interested in recently. And, and I had the opportunity to meet with Daniel Kahneman and, and uh, uh, his partner, Amos Tversky, uh, uh, has passed away, but um, uh, they won the Nobel Prize for understanding the problems of intrinsic bias of heurism in our decision making. So when we're making decisions with incomplete information, which we do every single day in the clinic, right? This is what we do, is we're making decisions, we're making recommendations with incomplete information, is trying to recognize where we might be introducing our own biases and trying to be more objective about this. And uh, their Nobel Prize was uh, really quite interesting, the notion of how often uh, our economic behavior is guided by heurism and it leads to irrational decisions. So again, what we want to guide is appropriate care. And we've got a lot of unknowns in that. We've got unknowns about what the natural history might be if we do nothing. We've got unknowns about what the risks of care might be, what the benefits of care might be. And I'm going to share with you, uh, this is a UCLA uh, RAND um, appropriate use criteria. I think most of you are familiar with this notion of an appropriate intervention is one where the benefits exceed the expected risk by a wide mo margin. Inappropriate would be the opposite, right? The expected risks exceed the benefits by a wide margin. We can rate things on a scale of 1 to 10 for how appropriate an intervention might be. And a lot of times we're kind of dealing in the, in the yellow zone where risks and benefits are somewhat balanced and it might be a patient preference. I think bringing patient preferences into this equation is so important to avoid us adopting a dogmatic approach or a monolithic approach to how we deal with problems. I think we need to respect variability. A lot of that variability has to do with the variation of how we might approach problems, and a lot of it has to do with the patient's perspective as well. But I want to share with you two specific studies, and this is the main point of, of what I want to emphasize in this talk today. Two studies that, I, that I've done that I think are really pretty useless, uh, but have been widely quoted. Um, one, again, the notion of appropriate use of care. This is probably one of the more expensive studies I've ever been part of. And this was uh, done with the Rand uh, uh, McNabb Corporation. And it was an interdisciplinary study that involved uh, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, family practitioners, anesthesiologists. And we played through uh, uh, about 700 scenarios where we were trying to find a threshold for where is surgery for degenerative scoliosis appropriate and where is it inappropriate? And I guess we started this project about 10 years ago. And, um, and the point being that the absence of granularity is profound. And, and this is, again, one of the more widely quoted studies, one of the more expensive studies, but it's almost completely useless. Because essentially what we found out is that, well, surgery is appropriate if patients have more severe symptoms. And if they have less severe symptoms, don't do surgery. That's pretty intuitively obvious. Um, progressive deformity would be more likely to operate on compared to stable deformity. And there's so many additional uh, characteristics about the size of the curve, the amount of stenosis. But, but intuitively, um, we tried to define where's the threshold for where would we say no, surgery's inappropriate here. And we really weren't able to define that threshold in part because we weren't given enough granularity in the case scenarios. And again, we're making major decisions based on limited information. What I'm going to suggest to you is that we need much more precise information. 
Steve Pinker wrote a, a terrific book. Um, he was actually the guest speaker at NASA a couple of years ago. And, and again, this notion of making informed choice under conditions of uncertainty. And oftentimes, what, what he focused on here is he introduced the term collective rationality. And collective rationality refers to what should we do as a society. And sometimes collective rationality is different than individual rationality. And, and what he argues, I think quite appropriately, is we need to think collectively in terms of our social justice, in terms of what we do as a nation. But individually is what we need to think about for our individual patients. So what might be appropriate for a broad clinical practice guideline? And we've done a lot of work. A lot of people in this room have contributed to the NAS clinical practice guidelines. So what we might do for degenerative spinal anesthesis, for spinal stenosis, for a population, is very different than a recommendation we might make for an individual. And that's why um, I think we really need to be much more precise than these guidelines recommend. If you actually read through the details, if you contribute to these guidelines, you'd, you'll find that almost invariably we've got grade B and C evidence. We very rarely have grade A evidence, meaning compelling evidence that this is the right thing to do. And the reason it's grade B and C evidence is that there's such a variation in who we're treating or who we're trying to apply population guidelines to. So the challenge is how do we bring recommendations that are re appropriate for a population to an individual and then really try and bring precision care into our thinking. I'm going to give you another example. This is, uh, most of you are familiar with the adult scoliosis study and Keith Bridwell and, and uh, Frank Schwab and I actually contributed to the design of this. UCSF didn't contribute uh, patients to the enrollment, but uh, people here, including Hanjo and others, have contributed patients. And what we see is, is on average, uh, if you look at the as treated uh, patients with uh, surgery versus non-operative care, on average, the surgical group did better. So they did better with regard to SRS subscores. They did better with regard to disability improvement. And, and on average, and I find myself almost every day in clinic saying, well, I think there's 85% of our patients have a measurable improvement of pain and function, somewhat based on this. Sometimes I actually give people this article. The trouble is, if you actually look at the scatter plot of the data, it's all over the place, right? So some people do great, some people do terribly. And a question that an informed patient may ask is, well, where am I? Where do I fit on the scatter plot, right? Am I going to be in the upper right corner? Or am I going to be down here in the lower left? And, uh, and what about me? And again, so often we're dealing with averages and means. And the problem of the mean is something that uh, so many of you are aware of Stephen Gould. Stephen was a mentor of mine in Boston. And, and Stephen was a paleontologist, and, and he taught a course called Three Approaches to the Mind. And what was interesting, he was my professor in 1996. And uh, in, in 1982, he was diagnosed with mesothelioma. And at Mass General Hospital, he was told, uh, you've got a 50% mortality at a year. And within five years, there's a 95% chance of you being dead. And fortunately for me, he uh, outlived that by, by a long way. So what he said is, he said, well, Doc, what about me? I understand the averages, but what about my genomics? What about my proteomics? What about my phenotype? How is that going to affect me? And, and indeed, in this case, uh, and what he wrote about here is that variation is nature's irreducible essence. So this idea of everybody's case is going to be different. So let's try and get away from the median isn't a message or the mean isn't a message. Trying to be really precise to the individual patient is the goal and, and also the challenge. So again, how do we make population recommendations appropriate to the individual? And, and this, is, this is part of what we've written about recently. So in a recent state-of-the-art review in uh, the Journal of Spinal Deformity, we put together some of the parameters that, that many of us uh, are, are routinely measuring. So uh, hemoglobin A1C, some metric of bone quality, body mass index, nutritional status, history of smoking, pain medications, uh, a frailty score, and you know, Shane and, and Chris have both done some terrific work trying to quantify the effect of frailty on uh, morbidity and mortality after surgery. One of the most important predictors we've got actually is a RAP score. So this is a risk assessment predictive tool. I don't know how many of you are using this, but it's a pretty strong predictor of length of stay and the likelihood of somebody going to rehab. So routinely applying this gives us a much more granular understanding of what's likely to happen to the individual patient. So somebody's taking more than 50 milliclobin of morphine per day, it's going to have a different experience than somebody who's opiate naive. Uh, somebody who's um, um, uh, got active, untreated anxiety or depression, somebody who doesn't have social support at home. So you have a very different experience in a perioperative period and perhaps might lead to very different recommendations for what's appropriate. So I'm going to uh, talk about, again, bringing more information to try and empower individual choice. 
And, and again, part of this, Keith Yamamoto, many of you are familiar with, he actually uh, was our invited speaker for a, a recent conference. And um, Keith Yamamoto is the director of the UCSF Institute for Precision Medicine. And a lot of his work is focused on cancer. But the idea of trying to be precise with um, the phenotype of the patient, with understanding genomics, transcriptomics, with understanding uh, protein metabolism, with understanding microbiome of the patient, and really trying to understand what's going to happen to the individual patient. I think UCSF has been a leaders, leading center for this for, car, for, for uh, cancer. CAR T cell therapies are really based on this. And applying these principles to uh, our spine work is, is really the next, next step. And Chris has led a lot of that as well. So the next step is a study where, uh, again, an incredibly expensive study that a number of people in the room contributed to, including all of our, our spine surgeons. Uh, this prospective study of patients who are over age 60, elderly patients with spinal deformities. So we identified patients who were having more than a five-level fusion. And this was a multi-center study that involved places uh, around the world. Um, on average, these patients were 68 years old, which is, again, according to demographics, pretty typical. And uh, most of these patients had uh, 10 levels fused. So th these were basically structural thoracic spine down to the pelvis. When we look at outcomes, so on average, patients did really well in a 20-point improvement to the ODI scores, which is certainly uh, uh, quite significant. Important improvement of VAS, EQ, 5D scores. Uh, SRS, every subdomain of the S SRS score improved significantly. So very good outcomes on average. Having said that, we also know that more than half these patients had some complication. In fact, on average, if a patient had a complication, they had more than two complications. And we broke these down in a medical, surgical, neural, and just to walk through some of the granularity of the data here is that uh, um, five patients, or well, two patients died in a perioperative period, three died kind of remotely from things unrelated to the surgery. Uh, there was um, uh, delirium. Uh, Yun talked about delirium, and I think we under-reported delirium, to be honest with you. I, I think 2% is really an underestimate in this patient population. In terms of surgical problems, implant failures, junctional pathology was common. And then neural complications. 18% of patients had a new motor or sensory deficit after surgery. And, and I'll tell you that that's something that I've more commonly, since our uh, scoli risk score, score a study, as well as our PEED study, more commonly talk to patients about the risk of neural deficits, uh, but that, that's a number that was a bit, a bit higher than I would have expected. Now, having said that, we're, we're dealing with apples and oranges here. So we've got information about change in ODI score, information about EQ5D. So I could tell you something about how many well years of life you're likely to get out of surgery, and that's something that might make some sense quantifiably. But what is the impact of a well year of life on a well year of life of a PE after surgery? What's the impact of a post-operative infection? What's the impact of having a radiculopathy or a causality that doesn't get better? So it's really difficult to quantify a comparison of is the benefit worth the risk? And so that weighing of appropriateness remains a challenge. And what we're trying to do now is trying to quantify the impact of complications on outcome. And one of the attempts we just wrote about in a recent paper uh, was looking at patients who had no adverse events versus at least one, and the majority had at least one adverse event. And in this relatively small sample size, we weren't able to show a significant difference. So the obvious next step is to grade the adverse events. And Eric Kleinberg and I are working on this to try and grade the adverse events and see if we can get a better correlation according to the grade of those events. We're doing some work on this with back pain, and I think that this model can apply really well to spinal deformity in the elderly as well. And with back pain, this is a large NIH-funded grant uh, that Jeff Lotz and, and Connor O'Neill and others are, of our group are looking at, is they're trying to define a phenotype for low back pain that encompasses uh, much more granularity than we might otherwise have. So everything from societal input to structure to MRI, quanti uh, quantifiable MRI characteristics to psychosocial impacts, and trying to uh, use metrics in each of these domains. And what the model is, and this isn't actual data, this is just a model right now, is that we take factors that include social cultural factors, epigenomics, genomics, biobehavioral factors, uh, people's um, uh, grit, uh, people's stick to uh, information from the EMR that may include labs, really advanced imaging, uh, biomechanical information, information about the structure of the spine, 
we could perhaps create clusters. And again, Chris has done a lot of this looking at the clustering of adult deformity, but create clusters where one group might have more of an inflammatory phenotype that leads to their back pain. It might be appropriate for anti-inflammatory approaches. One group might have more of a mechanical phenotype, uh, maybe a deconditioning phenotype that might be more appropriate for physical therapy. One group may have more of a me me mechanical profile uh, that's structural that might be more appropriate for, for surgery. So directing the right patient to the right approach. And I think this is where our large data analysis can really help. And, and so far, the studies that I really described in detail, the PEED study and the, um, uh, the appropriate use of surgery with the RAND Corporation study really didn't have the level of detail that I, we need to make these decisions. So, uh, you know, Chris, Chris and I co-edited this edition, and I think it's really worth looking at in terms of some algorithms to look at preoperative risk stratification, to look at algorithms for tumors, uh, for deformity, for degenerative disorders, look at some predictive models. And this is a, an area that still is in its infancy, and I think really Chris has been the person in our group who's contributed the most to it, and he's going to talk more about this this afternoon, so I won't bring up any more of these models, but a really nice overview. These are eight articles that really go through, I think, the state of the art of what we know right now about applying large data analysis using nonlinear models, and essentially machine learning is the ability to create models that are nonlinear, and uh, rather than our multifactorial analysis, which tend to be linear models. And it's a nice interview, a uh, nice overview with these articles. And again, why is this important? Well, I think it's really important for our quality metrics. So Dave Skaggs is in charge of looking at quality. He's got six cases where the screws went into the canal. What do we need to do about this? Well, what's the expected rate of that, right? So what's, if quality is a metric of expected versus observed, let's make sure that we're risk stratifying appropriately, right? If these are really complex cases with no pedicles, sometimes you can have an extra particular screw. At the same time, if this is a simple degenerative case, then our tolerance is less. So what's our expected rate? And understanding this for our quality metrics is really important in establishing appropriate uh, expected ratios. Um, when we look at shared payment models, right, we cannot responsibly participate in a shared payment model, be it a bundle payment model or an accountable care organization. Cannot do that possibly in an informed way unless we actually risk stratify our patients. Right now, the bundles described by Medicare, the four major bundles for spine, are completely non-granular. And, and every major center that's participated has learned that you cannot appropriately bundle patients, or you need more granularity to bundles to make them work. When to say yes or no to spine surgery. Okay, Rajiv Sethi is going to talk, I think, by video later today. But Rajiv's really been a, an expert on this, and he'll talk about that perhaps later today. And again, making patient-specific plans. So I'm going to wrap it up by just saying that in the aging population, spinal disorders are common, and they have a major impact on health. And I think that the outcomes of multi-level complex surgery, in general, demonstrate a good, reliable improvement in health status on average. But there's also a lot of complications. So the risk-benefit ratio is really hard to quantify. I think looking in more granularity about the phenotype of these patients, understanding some of the more subtle variants, and Chris is working on senility markers, um, uh, muscle, muscle quality, bone quality, frailty metrics, all of these are going to be more important than looking at the x-ray alone. And, and I hope on Saturday, as we're talking about the case, maybe that'll be brought into some of the discussion more than it's been before. And finally, the optimal treatment really requires informed choice and, and patient participation in choice. And that's why there's always been some variation behind uh, how we do these cases. And I think being accepting of those variations is something that I've has been a major transition in my career is being, being more accepting of variation and less dogmatic, and I think hopefully we'll all adopt that. So again, thanks for the opportunity to contribute. And uh, Chris, do we have a little time for, for Aleka's time for questions before lunch? Hopefully not just of me. I mean.